This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. We are here tonight because of a generous gift from the University of, to the University of Washington. This visiting professorship was created in 1961 with a bequest from the estate of Mr. John Dance. Mr. Dance came to the Seattle area in the early days of the 20th century and became a very successful entrepreneur in this region. He's perhaps best known for a chain of movie theaters he developed here in the state of Washington and elsewhere. John Dance was a self-educated man who read widely and liberally. He was particularly fascinated by scientific developments and was interested in the philosophy of humanism. In creating this endowment, his goal was to bring distinguished lecturers and scholars with an international reputation to the University of Washington. He particularly wanted to include those men and women, and here I'm quoting, who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Mr. Dance's wife, Jessie, shared this vision and gave additional gifts to this endowment until the time of her death. Several members of the Dance family are with us tonight, and I hope you'll join me in expressing our appreciation to them for this wonderful gift to the University of Washington and to our region. Our speaker tonight, Anna DeVere Smith, will be introduced by Assistant Professor Valerie Curtis Newton from the School of Drama. Good evening, it's an honor to be here. In 1991, the fires of rioting in Crown Heights, Brooklyn burned a painful reminder of the danger of difference, burned it into the psyche of Americans. By the light of those fires, we came to see the consequences of our inability to connect, our unwillingness to hear each other, our refusal to see each other. And in the ashes of those fires, we searched for the answers to these questions. What does this mean? How does it happen? How do we keep this from happening again? One year later, Anna DeVere Smith lit up the American stage with her answer to these questions when her, in her play, Fires in the Mirror. She had said three simple words that would change everything. She said simply, talk to me. And people did. And then she stood on stage alone in a room full of strangers and told truths, some easy to hear, some tough, she stepped into other people's shoes, and some would say on their toes, and spoke these truths exactly as they had been told to her. And for the first time in a long time, we as Americans were able to hear. Ms. Smith has followed the beacon fires of America's hot spots for more than 20 years in what she calls her search to find the American character. From Crown Heights to Los Angeles to the seats of political power and beyond, Ms. Smith is teaching us all how to talk to each other. Here at the University of Washington in the School of Drama, her work has become foundational in several arenas. Her inclusions in our theater history classes, the use of her techniques in our voice and speech classes, the performance of her work on our stages are testaments to the power of her ideas and her artistry. She reminds us as artists of the fundamental things of our craft, listening, specificity, and courage. Listening because how we respond in the moment is predicated on really hearing what has just been said. Specificity because there is, no matter how much we want to deny it, some truth to the cliche that the specific is universal. And courage because the possibility of being judged and misunderstood is very real. In her work, Ms. Smith reassures us that our work is worth the risk. 
For her efforts as actor, writer, and cultural critic, Ms. Smith has received numerous awards and accolades, two Obie Awards, MacArthur Genius Fellowship, nominations for the Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award. She's seen in films such as Philadelphia and Dave, and on TV series like The West Wing, ER, and The Practice. I've had the privilege of directing her play, Twilight Los Angeles 1992, on two occasions, and have seen how people are transformed both by the speaking and the listening. Our production used five women of various races and ethnicities, from a Scandinavian student who played Rodney King's aunt, to the black student who played a Korean shop owner, from a Latina student who played police chief Daryl Gates, to the Asian American student who played the, the Latino looter. All of them struggled with what it means to walk in the shoes of the other. They were all hungry to get it right and terrified they'd get it wrong. It was rewarding, but not easy work. There were more than a few tears along the way. But over time, we became an ensemble. And when the audience arrived, we all became a community, a community witnessing, a community listening, a community much like the one in this room tonight. I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Ms. Smith and inviting her to talk to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Anna DeVere Smith. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you once again to the dancers for uh, making this possible and to everyone who has uh, welcomed me here in Seattle. It's always great to be back. And uh, I had a great time last night uh, celebrating some of the uh, graduate students here and all of the people who are uh, doing work to increase the number of graduate students of color. And uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to uh, do, um, <coughs> I'm not going to be Nancy McNally, <laughs> although uh, just by a show of hands that I can't see. How many of you have heard my name because I'm on the West Wing? Can't see. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have heard of me because I spent my career working on race relations? Oh. <laughs> that's, 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 I'm happy about that. Anyway, so. Um, uh, I've been uh, going around with the tape recorder because when I was a girl, my grandfather said, if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. And so I've been trying to uh, work on that project of learning America through its words. And uh, unfortunately, I'm stuck in English, um, which complicates that project because frankly, I think at this point in our history uh, to know American character, I should go outside of these uh, boundaries. Um, so, uh, there we have it. Nonetheless, um, let's be in English for tonight uh, and see where we can go. So, um, uh, I use this tape recorder, everything is verbatim that you're going to hear tonight. And I'm going to start with my favorite person. Is anybody in the audience old enough to know who Studs Terkel is? Um, so, uh, Studs, I went to him a long time ago because uh, I was looking to find out, he's a radio man in Chicago, uh, born in 1912, the year the Titanic sank, greatest ship ever built, hits the tip of an iceberg, and bam, it went down, it went down, and I came up. Wow, some century. So I thought he would be the person to go to to try to find out if there was a defining moment in American history. Uh, this is what I found out. Uh, defining moment in American history. I don't think there's one. You can't say Hiroshima, that's a big moment. Can't think of any one moment I would say is a defining moment, but the gradual slippage, moral slippage. Slippage was the word used by Jeb Magruder, one of Nixon's boys. Moral slippage. But you see, we also have the technology. I say less and less the human touch. Oh, let me tell you a funny little playlet. 
The Atlanta airport is a modern airport. And as you leave the gate, there are these trains that take you out to a destination and onto a concourse. And you see, these trains are smooth, and they're quiet, and they're efficient. And there's a voice on the train. You see the voice? The voice is a human voice. You see, in the old days, we had robots. Robots imitated humans. Now we have humans imitating robots. So we got this voice on this train. Concourse one, Omaha, Lincoln. Concourse two, Dallas, Fort Worth. Same voice, just as the train is about to go. A young couple rush in, and they're just about to close the pneumatic doors. And that voice, without losing a beat, says, because of late entry, we're delayed 30 seconds. Just then, everybody's looking at this couple with hateful eyes. And the couple's going like this, you know, shrinking. Well, I'd happen to have a couple of drinks before boarding. I do that to steal my nerves and so I imitate a train call, holding my hand on my, George Orwell, your time has come. I say, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well, see, you're laughing. You're laughing. Oh, believe me, everybody laughs when I say that, but not on this train. <laughs> Silence. And so suddenly, they're looking at me. And so here I am with a couple, shrinking. The, foot of, the, the three of us at the foot of Calvary, about to be up, you know. Just then, I see a baby. <laughs> Little baby in the lap of a mother. I know it's Hispanic, because she's speaking Spanish to her companion. So I'm going to talk to the baby. So I say to the baby, holding my hand over my mouth, because my breath must be 100 proof. <laughs> I say to the baby, Sir, or madam, what is your considered opinion of the human species? <laughs> and the baby looks at all the way babies look at you, starts laughing, <laughs> starts busting out with its crazy little laugh. I say, thank God for a human reaction we haven't lost yet. But you see, you see the human touch, you see. That's disappearing, you see. So we ask about a defining moment. American history, there ain't no defining moment for me. It's an accretion of moments that add up to where we are now. <laughs> where we are now, where trivia becomes news, and more and more, less and less awareness of the pain of the other. So you see, this is an interesting dilemma with which we're faced. You know, I don't know if you could use this or not, but I was quoting Wright Morris, writer from Nebraska, who says, we're more and more in the communications and less and less in the communication. Okay, kids, I got to scram. Got to go see my cardiologist. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what I know about America. Uh, I've been trying very hard. Grew up in a kind of segregated town. Didn't like it. thought that intellectually that was a problem. Um, <laughs> you know. So, you know, I learned something about going where I didn't belong, kind of tested it out a little bit, and then I've spent most of my adult, adult life doing that. And um, so I think the most thing I know is that we were a, we were a debate. Uh, and, and all of us should work very hard to keep the debate alive, and we should get worried when it stops. And worried 
that there are not enough places where we can really debate and disagree and duke it out and talk for a long time. And so tonight, um, the I'm going to feature a couple of debates. And one of them comes from my play House Arrest, which you can get outside. Um, <coughs> and uh, I, I went to Washington uh, in 1995, and I um, stuck around there for five years. I hadn't planned to stay that long. I just went because I wanted to learn something about presidents. Mainly what I wanted to know was how, com how do they have time to be in the press so much? Uh, Clinton was in the press a lot. Bush is not in as much. His people are in. Um, but, you know, Clinton was always in the papers and everything. I thought, how's he get his work done? And so um, I wanted to go and find out, you know, what was the relationship of the press to the president. So I went there and uh, interviewed all these people and stuff and read all their books and everything. 510 people I'd interviewed. And press and historians and studied old presidents and new ones and talked to Bush Sr. and Jimmy Carter and, uh, and Clinton. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I was leaving, literally leaving, and that's when Monica Lewinsky happened. So I stuck around a little bit longer. <laughs> and, um, and, and interesting, at the same time, you know, that the Monica Lewinsky thing was going on, there was this other debate in history, which you all may have followed, about uh, Sally Hemings, the possible mother of Thomas Jefferson's children. And I thought that was a very interesting debate, not because of whether or not she really was, but, you know, what a different country we would have if she were a part of our mythology, you know, really a part of it, this black woman who was the mother of the children of, you know, Thomas Jefferson, the great big contradiction. And um, so I interviewed two different pe lots of different people about this, and, and, and I made this, um, I simulate this uh, argument as if they were arguing, but they weren't. I just took the two interviews and kind of interspliced them. And one is a Jefferson scholar whose name is Roger Kennedy, and the other is a woman called Annette Gordon-Reed who uh, wrote a very, very good book on Sally Hemings, which is what sort of got us interested in general in the public, and then the scientists came in with all their DNA stuff, but Annette Gordon-Reed was really out there in front. So this is called Unconsummated Affection slash Deep Denial. And it starts with Roger Kennedy, and he, I'm going to go back and forth, and he sounds like this. I think Jefferson was, and I think Jefferson is a man. That's how he talks. And then Annette Gordon-Reed talks like this. Well, that's crazy. Okay, so you got the two? <laughs> now, Roger Kennedy is a white man, um, and Annette Gordon-Reed is a black woman who was the first black woman, I believe, to be in the Harvard Law Review. She's a, a, a legal scholar, and, and she desegregated her schools in Texas. So that's who they are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Roger Kennedy was drinking tea in a very well-lit uh, uh, sort of kitchen area that he had in his house near Washington. And Annette Gordon-Reed is in the Paramount Hotel having a mimosa in, San in uh, New York. And she had, um, not dreadlocks, braids, okay. I think Jefferson was an, I think Jefferson as a man of words and unconsummated uh, affections. Uh, there's just not a shred, not a shred of evidence. Well, that's crazy that before his wife, or after his wife, there was anybody with whom he was intimate physically. Well, that's crazy. I just think, <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think it's necessary. That's not true. That's the asexual idea. That is just untrue. And when somebody says something like that, they can say the evidence doesn't convince them. But to say there's no evidence, that person, not a shred, is in deep denial. And that person, you have to sit back and think, what is it about that story that bothers you? Because you're dealing, you're not dealing realistically with it. There's not a shred. It may be not be enough to convince people. It's enough to convince me. It would convince people like any other guy in the world, any other slave owner in the world. There'd be no question about it with what I presented. You can say it's not enough evidence, not enough to convince you. But to say there's not a shred of evidence, evidence is just wrong. It's just flat wrong. <laughs> Here are the signs and signals that there is this succession of young men, quite handsome, all of them, that were his secretaries. 
a gay friend of mine thinks this is terribly exciting. I haven't seen it written anywhere, but there's a suggestion that, well, maybe, you know, maybe he was gay. Maybe that's why he, n you know, never got married again after his wife died. And I was joking with someone about this. I said, it's sort of like pick your nightmare for historians. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, it's like, it, you know, it's, it's like pick your, your nightmare for historians. I mean, it's like if there's any animation that he was gay, somebody pick up the Sally Hemings just st story looks like that. Oh, but she was the love of his life. It's like, which is worse, to be involved with a black woman or be gay? Now, the problem, the problem with the gay angle is, as I say, if you don't have something, any indication that he had sex with men, but we need a name or an instance or something that indicates that before we, before we can accept that as a realistic alternative dish. You see what I'm saying? I don't care, in a sense. He surrounded himself with beautiful people, mostly male, because it's safe. And where the hell are you going to get a beautiful female to have around you if you're not married to her in Virginia? I mean, anything is possible. The other thing is that he masturbated. Some people say that, you know, well, how do we know that he wasn't just masturbating all this time? And that's how he, I mean, there are any number, I mean, he could have been doing anything masturbating. There are people who thought that he just masturbated. <laughs> that he just masturbated, and that's how he, people have said this, people talk about it, historians surmise that. <laughs> I think it's only sad, because the chances that he ever got anywhere, that they ever got anywhere together are just zero. No! I think he was, in lo I mean, I think he was lonesome. I mean, we all get lonesome. The cohabitation was palpable. And when you're in that bed, and in that room, and the smell and sound of black people is absolutely the first thing that hits you in the morning. Every laugh, every salacious comment, every what you're having for breakfast is right there where that pond is, right there. It's that close. The guy serving you your tea is your nephew. Really, that's just, that's that, that, that you can, that, that's very rough torture, I think. The obscenity is that very few who got so interested in it were interested in all those red-headed kids running around Monticello. Nobody paid any attention to them until they got interested in the possibility that Mr. Tom had produced a baby with a black woman when the place was teeming with kids produced with black women. And we're talking about scores of children produced in a power relationship. He lived in a swarm of children conceived in power relationships. They're unacceptable, any moral person. Instead of being mad at him, which is easy, this is somebody who lived for a, until 80, knowing that he was living every day in moral ambiguity. Everything he did had a shadow side to it. In 1806, there was a very large congressional debate about whether slaves were to go in the Louisiana Purchase or not. And Jefferson, who had done nothing since 1784 to make it harder for slavery to spread into the West, nothing found it convenient not to have his acquisition free. Everything after that, Missouri and all the rest of it, flowed from a failure to stop it when it could have been stopped. It isn't true that we didn't have another chance. So we could have not had our mess this bad. Yeah, to me, that's the story. And this is a story about a family of people, whether it's Jefferson or not, and these, fam these people were cut out of that family because of race. That's the first debate. I'm going to depart from my um, usual style of things and uh, do a, an unexpected uh, character. Uh, this is a, a cowboy. Uh, I, th this summer, I spent uh, following around a cowboy, not the whole summer, but last summer, a considerable amount of time following around a cowboy uh, who was a bull rider. You know, the bull riders are the star of the rodeo. So um, I went to the rodeo with him and everything. And uh, <coughs> here he is. And his name is Brent Williams. And this is called um, Born Loser. 
Like, I'm an optimist. I'd say I'm an optimist, you know, because, like, you know, like, sometimes, sometimes I think, man, I got bad luck. But then I think back, like, you know, like, you know, they took out my kidney, you know, when that bull stepped on my back. Like, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me. I could have lost my kidney, you know. But so that was good luck, you know. I kept my kidney, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people say, you know, you ever think you're a bad loser and, you know, you just had so much bad luck, you know. It's like I just read this deal in the Reader's Digest. Things like this happen. It's so funny. Like, I go to the doctor's last CAT scan. There's Reader's Digest just from October 2002 sitting there, you know, and it talks about seven ways to get lucky, you know, it's talking about how, like, to be lucky, you got to, you got to be positive, got to have positive people with you to be, you know, if, if you want to be lucky, and when I met you, you know, my wife, she said, you know, she won't call you, you know, she's just talking, she's just being nice to you, she's just being nice to you, you know, she, she really wouldn't want to do that, and, and then when you said you was going to come and interview me and stuff, you know, my wife said, she told me, she said she was worried that, like, I was going to make myself look like an idiot, you know, because she says since, you know, I didn't go to college, she's just thinking I'm not going to know how to talk professional, you know, and she's worried because she thought, you know, I didn't know how to talk professionally, and I was like, I talked to the lady for four hours, and if I wasn't talking like, you know, she she wouldn't have called me, you know, if she's worried about me not being professional, so, you know, I don't think I'm a born loser. <laughs> Confidence? Oh, well, I think confidence is a part of it, you know, because I, but I think I ride more off of determination than confidence, because confidence is like you've been on that bull before, and you know you're going to ride him, and confidence is kind of like maybe being cocky about it, you know, but in a good way. Um, if you're, but if you ride with determination, it's like, you know, the form, get the horn. <laughs> you know, tough heat him and saying, you know, he's in the movie eight seconds, you know, he's like world champion three times because he didn't ride with style, you know, he, he rode with determination, you know, you just, you just hang on till the whistle blows, no matter if you're riding upside down, yeah, so determination, you know, like Pat, my wife's uncle, he always says, man, you know, you got the most try of any kid I've ever seen, like try and determination is the same thing, you know, like there's been a lot of times when you just, a lot of bull riders, they safety up, and me, I've never safety up my whole life, and a lot of times, you know, it may get me stepped on or something, but like determination, I, you know, it's just like, you know, you just, you just ride till your head hits the back of the dirt. <laughs> freedom? Well, that ha <laughs> that'd have to be the rodeo, freedom. <laughs> beauty? Uh, I don't know if I know what beauty is, but I guess that'd have to be the rodeo, too, you know, just like, you know, we're always shaking hands and wrestling around, and just like family, that'd be beauty. Toughness? Well, we was in West Jordan, uh, Utah, and I, and I had this bull shove my face, like, right through the metal chutes, and I mean, my nose didn't, I spent four, five hours sewing my face up, and they didn't even knock me out, and everybody said that, you know, it should have killed me, and my buddies took me to the hospital, and when they straightened out my nose, and I had to be at a rodeo that night, and I didn't really want to be under anesthesia or whatever you, however you say it, so I told them to do it without it, and they shoved these two rods up your nose, and they worked their way up, and it straightened your nose all up, and it felt like it was just going right through my brains and out the top of my head, so, but I have a high tolerance of pain, so that's, I think that, I think that would be toughness. But once they did that, I could breathe, you know, and I couldn't breathe through my nose since I broke it in high school in the rodeo. <laughs> struggle? Well, yeah, I know about struggle. Um, struggle with my brother's death and, uh, like, you know, like, goes back to when I was riding steers. Remember I told you I borrowed a rope from, uh, you know, Pat O'Meal. He gave me a flinker of a cotton rope. See, uh, see, I didn't have no one telling me how to ride or anything when I was little, and so I went to the store and, and uh, just bought me a cotton rope, you know, and all these other kids, they was riding with $100 ropes, you know, and my rope was $5 rope, and didn't look like what, you know, they had, you know, and I didn't have, like, you know, the spurs they had, and they kind of make fun of me, and I'd always beat him, and I thrived off of that, you know, and that's kind of like struggling. I think, you know, well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I don't, maybe I don't know what struggle is. Maybe I didn't struggle. I don't know. But, you know, well, now that you say that, you hit the nail on the head. It's kind of like, uh, you know, my mom, I don't know exactly what she has, but after she had me, she went crazy, had to go to the mental institution, and I came back home, and, uh, you know, uh, 
us kids were here with her one time in Gooding, and she had like a nervous breakdown. We were sleeping, and she woke us up and said, oh, the house is on fire, and we're like, we don't see no fire, you know, and I was pretty little, maybe 10 or so, and we had to get in the car, go to the police station here in Gooding, and told the police, I don't, I don't see no fire, and she's going crazy saying there's a house on fire, and my parents got divorced, and I went to live with my father, and my grandparents were right across the street, so they took care of us, and my mother had my sister after she got divorced, so my sister lived with my mom for a while, but then my mom did catch a house on fire, and my sister was in there too, and my mom burned the house up, she was about two, and so my sister uh, came and lived with us, but You know, I had a lot of bad things happen to me. And um, like at the time, I'll think they're bad luck, you know. But no, it could be worse. But, you know, the uh, only thing I don't understand is, you know, is, uh, is why my brother had to die, you know. Mm -mm. Got a call from my dad about 6 in the morning and said, Brent, I was like, yeah. He said, BJ's been in an accident. <clears throat> I'll be over in a few minutes to pick you up. And he's kind of like in a coma. And have you ever been like asleep, you know, and you can feel when somebody walks in the room, you know, well, he wasn't responding. And then I walk in the room and he's trying to sit up like, you know, he's just... He knew I was there, and he's unconscious and everything, but he just knew it was me. And I'll never forget, like, he's trying to sit up, you know. And the, out good, the outlook was good, you know, and they thought he's going to be all right. And got a Christmas tree that Saturday morning, and I was at home on the tractor, and Jolene came and got me and said, you know, you got to get to the hospital right away. Your brother's not going to make it. And uh, so, uh, you know, we went up and uh, drove up there, and, he was alive for about another hour, and I can't even explain, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like they told us we had to leave, and they took him away, so, you know, that was someone that, you know, like, no matter what you did, if you ever got in trouble or whatever, he wasn't judging you, and see, pneumonia is what killed him because he laid out in the field, and he threw up and went down his lungs, and it's kind of bad deal because the cops blew it all out of proportion. These cops, you know, they cover shit up. And they said my brother was speeding and he was going over 100 miles an hour and he, he drove slow, you know, and, 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 and trying to make it look like he was just a loser kid. And there was nothing about the owner of the cow because it's our responsibility to keep them, you know, to keep them in, you know, and there's nothing about the owner of the cow's responsibility to keep the cow off the road. So they said he was speeding and he was like totally wasted and stuff, which I know my brother and he probably, you know, probably had a beer on the way home or something like that. And there's times you get drunk, you know, but I honestly believe this. He could have been totally drunk and he would have made it home if that cow hadn't been out on the road. It's a black cow and it's at night cow was on the road. And you can see where he hit the side of the cow and cut the cow's head off like from the corner post of the window. And then it flew in and hit him upside the head and kind of, I'm sure it knocked his head and just caused him to swerve. So then the cops, they say he's ejected. Well, the front window wasn't even broke out. He had a bad temper. He'd get pissed off and punch things and beat things up. They had looked, he would have seen he had cuts on his knuckles. He punched his glass window out because he was so mad. He got out of the car and punched the driver's side window, you know, he was trying to start to walk to get help. And then that's when he collapsed, you know, in the field. It's like November, and the end of November was snowing or cold, you know. And so they wrote a deal in the paper. I have it still to this day. It pisses me off every time I read it, trying to make it look like he was speeding. And he was just some punk-ass kid, you know. Like, me and my brother got so much respect in the community because the neighbors seeing how hard we work growing up. But you know one thing I tell you, I just cannot imagine, I cannot imagine not riding bulls. I hate even thinking about the day. I'm sure I could do whatever you know when it's time to quit. I, I have my ranch. And my cows, I have something to do, but it's just like, I don't know. 
I don't know how to describe the feeling. I just know there'd just be like a great big old empty space in me, I think. Maybe even bigger empty space in me than like, you know, when my brother died. I, I don't know for sure how it would be. I guess what I feel like is when I'm done rodeoing, probably be like the day my, my brother died because kind of like you lose your close family. And I'm sure we'll stay in contact when we're all done riding, but it won't be the same, you know. You know, we just go to them rodeos and we live together. You know, we spend 24 hours in a car driving straight through, hanging out in the bar in the hotel room, and, you know, we eat together and just can't even imagine. I'd be like losing him, I think. That's Brent Williams. So the featured piece is, is um, something that I did uh, a part of last night, <clears throat> and um, this is not uh, something that I it did found myself, uh, but it is the most musical language that I know uh, that I've ever come across after all these years of going around with my tape recorder. It is a conversation between James Baldwin, the African-American author, and Margaret Mead, uh, the white anthropologist. <clears throat> And it, they had never met, and then in 1971, uh, they sat down and they, they met, and then they came together again soon after that, and they talked for eight hours on a tape recorder. And in the early days of my trying to figure out this experiment of finding American character through the words and the language, I came across this, like at those days, it was records, like eight records set at the Museum of Natural History and probably spent a week's salary or something buying it and um, just fell in love with it. And this year I was getting ready for a performance at Carnegie Hall and uh, James Baldwin's estate allowed me to use it and uh, as did um, Margaret Mead's daughter, Mary Catherine Bateson. And so I've, this is an excerpt of it and, um, and, uh, and so I'm gonna uh, do that uh, as my featured uh, debate tonight about America, and I hope that you think that some of it is pertinent to where we are now, not just in race relations, but in the world. And I think it's time for us to move quickly beyond our problem inside these borders and to see what we have learned from it that we can apply to the much, much larger problem that we have in front of us, which is how on earth, uh, you know, the human race is going to make it through. That's the race we really have to be worried about. And this is called a rap on race. James Baldwin and Margaret Mead. And this little section I call shoulder to shoulder. And in case you don't know what uh, James Baldwin sounds like, he sounds like this. We've been talking about time present and time past. God knows, you know. That's him. And then she talks like this. But you did use the word atonement and you did use the word sins against the Holy Ghost. Okay, so you got that? We've been talking about time present and time past. God knows, you know, I'm not the least interested in carrying on the nightmare. Nevertheless, if I pretend that it did not happen to me, that I was not there, then I cannot live. That's what I mean by history being present. I don't mean that I have a bill to pay back on. But you did use the word atonement, and you did use the word sins against the Holy Ghost. Ah, yes. And you did use the word simply shouldn't be forgiven. Ah, yes, ah, yes. And let me say exactly what I mean by that. If I, Jimmy, offend you, Margaret, and I pretend I haven't, I've sealed my life off from all life, all light, all air, and I will not get past my crime if I pretend I did not commit it. I agree with you about us. If I've offended you, then I have to come to you and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm only talking about that. Yes, but you see, I agree. I'm not talking about crime and punishment, but you see, I agree with you about me and you now and the children and the future. Uh -huh. But if you take the past, all right, my an the past is a present. Wait a minute. My ancestors were hunted through the caves of Scotland and tortured. I know. Should I go back now? I'm not talking about and have a conversation with the Catholic Scots. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about going back. Nobody, nobody, nobody can anyway. But you were talking about the framework of American civilization, is it? And my ancestors and my aunt were hunted through the caves before they got here too. Yes, but, and I don't think it's particularly relevant except what I heard as a child. Yes, but my ancestors 
also had a curious history and were penalized and are penalized for it here. You're not penalized, Jimmy, for your history. Oh, yes, it's written on my back. No, what you're penalized for is the ridiculous attitude. You can find it in places with totally different histories or European notions of superiority. We're both exiled. No, I'm not in exile because I'm an American who goes abroad. I'm not in exile. Well, I'm in exile because the terms, and this is the point, the terms in which my life was offered to me in my country were entirely intolerable and unacceptable. Unacceptable, right. My countrymen drove me out. The Americans drove me out of my country. But you've never left in spirit. We did, on that famous day in Washington. I was there. When Martin Luther King gave the I have a dream, yes. And you know the answer we got two weeks later, 10 days later, out of that enormous petition? You know the first answer the Republic gave us? My phone rang one morning. I was back in Hollywood, God knows why. And a core worker was telling me she could hardly talk that four black girls had been bombed into eternity in a Sunday school in Birmingham. That was the answer the Republic gave. But you see, I would say that the Republic did not give that answer because I'm a part of the Republic and I didn't give it. And this is the thing. I'm not accusing you. I'm not accusing. Now, wait a minute. Who are you accusing? I'm accusing the Republic. Who? What's, what's the Republic? You can't accuse an entity like the Republic. My countrymen. Well now, well, now, who are you accusing, though? My countrymen. Now, wait a minute. You see, this is the thing. My countrymen. Rich countrymen. My countrymen. All of them? All of them. All right? That includes me, too. Includes me, too. Did you bomb those little girls in Birmingham? I'm responsible for it. Didn't stop it. Why are you responsible? Didn't you try to stop it? Hadn't you been working? Doesn't matter what one tried. Of course it makes a difference what one tried. See that this now, now this is you, now you're talking like a Greek Orthodox. You're talking exactly <laughs> like a Greek Orthodox. We're all gilly because some man somewhere is murdered. No, 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 no. We're all responsible. Look, you're not responsible. The blood is also on my hands. Why? Because I didn't stop it. All right? Is the blood on your hands of somebody who's dying in Burma today? Yes. You didn't stop that. That's what I mean by being a Greek Orthodox. And I will not accept it. For whom the bell tolls. <laughs> I will not. For whom the bell tolls. No, that's different. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, means I am concerned about the suffering in the world. No, it means everybody's suffering is mine. Everybody's suffering is mine, not everybody's murdering is mine. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> I'm one of the dispossessed. I've been told nothing but lies. You too have been told nothing but lies. That's right, we've both been told lies. My situation is our situation, really. My situation presents itself as to me as exceedingly urgent. I cannot lie to myself about some things I cannot. I mean, I have to know something about myself and my countrymen. And the most terrible thing about it is, the most ter what's really terrible is to face the fact that you cannot trust your countrymen that you cannot trust them, that the assumptions by which they live is antithetical to any hope that you may have to live. I'm not denying any of these facts, but what I'm trying to consider is whether there is an inevitable difference in the spiritual stance in your... We can't talk about spiritual stance unless we talk about power. I'm talking about power. I'm talking about that South African miner on whom the entire life of the Western world is based. But you know, we're not having a rational conversation at this point. <laughs> what I feel is this. We agree that we're both Americans. We agree in a sense of responsibility for the present and the future. You have approached this present moment by one route, and I've approached it by another. Now, in the terms of the colors of our skin, you represent a course of victimization and suffering and exploitation and everything in the world, and we can make any number that, and I represent the group. <sighs> now, wait a minute. If you 
with just you, skin color. I represent the group that were in the ascendancy, were the conquerors, had the power, owned the land. You can say anything you like. All right. Now, here we both are. Furthermore, however, nevertheless, now, is it necessary for you to narrow history, and I really think this is the proper phrase, and express only despair or bitterness, while I express hope. And is this intrinsic to our position at the moment, or can we, both of us, out of such a different past and such a different experience and a contemporarily different experience, because you, in your own country, wherever you go, are likely to meet with insult and indignity, danger. Yeah. Whereas, wherever I go, on the whole, if they haven't heard me say I was in favor of marijuana, I am greeted, on the whole, with kindness. Now, given that fact, can we both, nevertheless, stand shoulder to shoulder, a continent or an ocean away, working for the same future? Now, I think this is the problem. I don't think it's a problem at all. <laughs> you know, supposition about being shoulder to shoulder, I take it as a fact. But you see, <laughs> you and I, you see, I said we were both exiled. You said we were, but you are. You are. Because of what you know. I am what? <laughs> An exile. Oh, no, I'm not from the mainstream of life in this country. I am not in exile. I am absolutely not in exile. I live here, and I live in Samoa, and I live in New Guinea. I live everywhere on this planet that I have ever been, and I am no exile. <laughs> you mean you refuse to accept the conditions of being in exile? What? I what? You refuse to accept the conditions. It just really isn't meaningful to me to say that. You see, I am not in exile. I am no exile. I am at home. <coughs> I can't say that. And you can't say this. You know, and this is, this is, this is, this is one of the dramatic points of difference. <coughs> I'm not at home. <coughs> I'm not at home. Anywhere on this planet? Forever. I'm not romantic. I'm not at home here. I never will be. Well, could you imagine a place that you could be at home? That means that I will never, 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 as long as I live, be at home anywhere in the world. Well, it could change your present if you could imagine it. Anywhere in the world, because my countrymen, because my countrymen have rejected me and the terms of their acceptance I will not accept. There is no power under heaven or under the sea or beneath hell that will ever allow me to take my place in this particular pantheon. I reject it in toto. From the virgin birth to the alabaster Christ, I reject it in toto, but nothing but death and misery to me and mine. You keep talking about the possibility that the Western world doesn't meet its ethic of the present, it will go down. There is no it will go down, the whole planet will go down. That may happen. It is crucial. At the present moment in history, what the Western world does is crucial. You say history, I say time. All right, present time, I'm perfectly willing to say either one. We've got the change has got to occur here within this country. But, but, but it won't. Hmm? But it won't. Well, then why are you alive? It won't. Why do you stay alive one day? Well, somebody will come after it. Well, not on this planet. America's not about to change. Wait a minute. Not on this planet, then. I mean, if I, I've made it through the entire human race, and I know 
But America is not about to change. However paradoxical that may sound, however contradictory that may sound, this ignorant people have yet to discover. And so you'll contribute to it's not changing. Oh, well, that's what you're doing now, you see. Not in your earlier books, but that's what you're doing now, you see. You're contributing to it's not changing and to the destruction of all human life on this planet. No. <laughs> yes, you are. I don't think so, but I cannot be deluded by the people I know best of all in the world. Do you think if you tell them that they won't change, they will? Are you trying to provoke them into better behavior? Somebody said, Allen Ginsberg said, you know, don't call a cop a pig, call him a friend. You call him a friend, act like a friend. I know more about cops than that. Which cops? All the cops. You don't know anything. You don't know anything about the young college people that are going to the cops today. I know, I know a lot. <laughs> I know a lot about the colleges. I'm sorry. You don't know a thing in the world about the young college people that are going into a tough situation with a tough ethos trying to change it. <sighs> I'm not being objective. No, I don't think you should be. I'm trying to say this. I don't think I'm being objective either. No, I know you're not. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. <laughs> no, I'm speaking out of a passion of what I believe. Yes, precisely. Now, we've got to make some connection, connection between what you believe and what I've endured. I'm talking to you, which is the best this country can afford, the moment can afford. You don't exist in this country either. Oh, yes, I do. Any more than I do. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. Jimmy, that won't go. That just won't go. Let me put it another way. You and I, both in the same very difficult hot seat. America doesn't want you any more than wants me. Jimmy, it isn't true. We have to face the fact that's just not true. Oh, you think I'm popular here? No, but I am. <laughs> you think so? Yes. Well, you're tough. <laughs> no, 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 I belong here, you know. So do I. But you at the moment think your belongingness is non-existent, so you make another step. Okay, that's them. Okay, and I'm going to finish up. I'm going to finish up with two characters uh, from my play Twilight. Has anybody out here performed in Twilight? The professor was saying that you've done Twilight here at this school. No, oh, you have. Um, so uh, Twilight is about the Los Angeles tragedy. It's about the Los Angeles riots. And uh, the whole play is like a great big complicated debate. It's not as like those uh, two I did today. First of all, it's not just black and white. And, you know, if I would like to leave you with anything, it's the idea that America has been based on debate, but now we need symphonies. And uh, that's going to call for you to be able to hear differently, hear different tones. When you're in an argument, I encourage you to argue. The people, those wonderful arguments, debates, like with between Baldwin and uh, you know, me don't happen anymore because everybody has to be so cool. But when you're in an argument, leap and look and find the different tones. Turn them into symphonies. But uh, going to, the lo to Los Angeles after the riots was like hearing a huge symphony. And um, uh, all of, some of you are probably so very young, but you know that there was a black man who was pulled over by the cops and beaten and it was on videotape and all the world saw it and thought the four cops that did so would go to jail. They didn't and there were riots. And um, uh, what people forgot was that there was another trial that George Bush Sr. asked for and that trial came back with a verdict of guilties on two of the cops and two guilties on, on uh, two guilties, two cops guilty, two cops not guilty. And you know, I went to that trial and uh, went to hear the verdict. People were like, celebrating in the seat, streets, but there were a group of people uh, who kind of uh, had no thing, nothing to celebrate about. Um, and uh, among that group were the Korean Americans whose um, stores had been burned to the ground. And this woman, Mrs. Young Sun Han, uh, is somebody who I went to visit who lost her business in the riots. And uh, this is one of the more complex little uh, arias about race um, that I've collected over time. This is Mrs. Young Sun Han, and this is called Swallowing the Bitterness. 
when uh, I was in Korea. I used to watch uh, many luxurious uh, Hollywood uh, lifestyle movies. I never saw any poor man, any black, maybe uh, one housemate. I used to believe America was uh, the best. I still do. I don't deny that. But at the end of 1992, when we were in such turmoil and having all the financial problems and all the mental problems, I began to really realize that Koreans are completely left out of this society and we are nothing. Why? Why do we have to be left out? What is our right? Is it because we are Korean? Is it because we have no politician? Is it because we don't speak good English? Why do we have to be left out? We didn't qualify for medical treatment. No food stamp, no GR, no welfare, anything. Many African American who never work get minimum amount of money to survive. We didn't get any because we have a car and a house, and we are a high tax payer. Okay. Where do I find justice? <laughs> okay. Many African Americans probably think they won by the trial. I was sitting here watching them the morning after the verdict and all the day. They were having a party. They celebrated all the South Central, all the churches. And they say, well, finally, justice has been done in this society. Well, what about victims' rights? They got their rights by destroying innocent Korean merchants, okay, okay? They have a lot of respect, as I do, for Dr. Martin King. He is the only model for black community. I don't care, Jess Jackson. <laughs> he is the model of nonviolence, nonviolence. And they were all like to have his spirit. Well, what about 1992? They destroyed innocent people. And I wonder if that is really justice for them to get their rights in that way. I was uh, swallowing the bitterness, <laughs> sitting here alone and watching them. They became so hilarious. But I was happy for them. I was glad for them. At least they got something back. Okay. Let's just forget about Korean victims and other victims who were destroyed by them. They fought for their rights for over two centuries, and maybe because of their sacrifice, other minorities, Hispanic, Asian, we would suffer more in the mainstream. That's why I understand. That's why I have a mixed feeling about the verdict. But I wish that I could be part of their enjoyment. I wish that I could live together with black people. But after the riot, it's a too much difference. The fire is still there. How do you say? Ignorant. Oh, right. That's what you're right. Ignite, igniting, igniting, ignite, igniting fire. 
igniting fire is still there. It can uh, burst out any time. Okay, this is the last debate, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I'm about five minutes over. This is the last debate, and it is by one person doing all the parts. So in finding this woman who I didn't know uh, in L.A., I was performing, and somebody saw me on stage and said, uh, came back and s backstage, oh, my God, you got to know this person, blah, blah, blah. She was at the trial, that second trial, and so I interviewed her, and she's kind of like out of the thousand, many, many people I've interviewed, by now over these so many years. Uh, she's like me in a little bottle of funny. You'll see what I mean. She does what I do. Um, and uh, she doesn't realize she's acting. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she th you'll see. She has, she's put, she's gonna put on a whole play for you and that's my finale. Anyway, this is Maria who uh, was at the second trial and I'm actually wearing high heels just to play her. Okay, so this is called AA meeting. Okay, y'all, so I'm going to tell y'all how we came up with that verdict, okay? So um, we get in here and we say, you know, let's get with the evidence, right? And first, it, you know, things was going pretty good. It was leaning so much towards the guilty on pal. And somebody raised their hand and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think what we should do first is just color code our book. And so, oh, color code your book. Oh, that's like you put like a, you know, like, you know, you, you put a little green tab here because you want to find out, say, you know, what like the Highway Patrol said. And so that's what we did for that whole afternoon. We just color code our book. Okay. So now um, we get in here the next day and things are going pretty good. And somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think, you know, I'm, this is too much on my, I'm tired. You know, I think what we should do, we should just quit. You know, and then we come back and start tomorrow. I just can't take it no more. And so I'm thinking, you know, okay, I know every time we quit, we go backwards, you know, because we're not allowed to talk about the case outside. And people would not talk about the case, you know, you know, because we're human, but they, would, they wouldn't talk about the case, but they would talk about the person. And that's not talking about the case, that's talking about the person. Anyway, so anyway. <laughs> so one morning at breakfast, we were talking about it. Somebody said, I mean, like, look at Rodney King, you know, why should we spend all this money on a man like that? And saying all these things, I said, it, oh, because for these people, you know, Rodney Rodney King had did these things to these police officers. <laughs> so why should we be spending all this money on a man like that? And they would talk about his parole holes and all this stuff that did not have nothing to do with this case, right? So, um, you know, this case was why was Rodney King's civil rights violated? You know, not what kind of man was Rodney King or what kind of man the defendants were, and it didn't come up in the courtroom, so, you know, why should, should it be coming up in this breakfast room? So anyway, so we get in here the next day, and we're going through the evidence, and this woman says, oh, my God, you know, I'm getting a headache. You know, uh, uh, I think I'm going brain dead. This is just too much on my head. Let's just quit. Let's just go back to the hotel. I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, I don't want to go back to the hotel. I said, there's nothing to do back there but eat or sleep. I said, I don't want to go back there. I want to stay here. So the foreman goes, okay, Maria, you know, just calm down, calm down. We're not going to go back to the hotel. We're going to stay here. But what we're going to do, we're all going to do what we want to do for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, so that's what we do for the rest of the afternoon. We just all do what we want. Okay, so uh, now we come back in here the next day, and now I'm pissed because it looks like every time we get right here, somebody is tired, somebody's having a headache, or somebody is brain dead. So um, I'm talking to this one guy about this PCP stuff, and he starts saying all this stuff that didn't have nothing to do with this case, right? And so I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. I said, I do not trust you. I said, I am looking on this book, and it says this, 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 this. I said, wait a minute, Maria. Wait a minute, Maria. Now, calm down, calm down. Now, why don't you trust Norman? I said, I heard what is going on around here. I said, it was not directed at me. But what do y'all mean? Why should we be spending all this money on a man like that? I said, if you felt that way, you should have said that to the judge from the beginning. That should not be coming up here. Well, now, Norman gets all red in the face, right? Now, the black man stands up. You was at the trial. You know that old black man? Him. He stands up. Now, Maria, I think you're being too sensitive about this thing. You know that Norma was just playing, and we've been kidding 
ever since we got here. And you ain't got no right to talk to Norman like that. Well, that just broke me because I did not expect that from him. And plus, it just opened up for everybody just to jump on me. Yeah, you trying to start some shit. <laughs> so I ran out the room, and I was crying and crying and crying, you know. And I, I ran to the bathroom. I was trying to get myself together. You know, I washed my face. You know, I tried to... You know, I tried to come back in here all strong. You know, I tried to smile. So now I come back in here. Now everybody's hugging me. Oh, Maria. Oh, Maria. Oh, Maria. Oh, Maria. We so sorry. We so sorry. That's another thing. I don't know why they're always telling me they sorry, right? Except the black man, he didn't say he was sorry, right? So uh, now the white guy who I was having a fight with about the PCP stuff, now he busts out crying. Oh, Maria. I just want you to know I marched in a Martin Luther King march. <laughs> I don't know what that had to do with anything. So now, you know, we come back in here the next day, you know. <laughs> you know, that night, you know, nobody could sleep, nothing. You know, and that day after I broke, you know, the next day we come back in here. That is the day we had our AA meeting. No, 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 y'all, don't laugh. Wait till you hear this. You're going to go, my God. <laughs> we get back in here. Nobody couldn't sleep, nothing. The foreman raised his hand. I just want everybody to know I called Alice an asshole at breakfast. Here come Alice. I don't think it's fair for you to call me an asshole like that. I don't think, I, I think you should apologize to me in front of everybody because it's really, really not fair. Here comes Steve, the foreman, raise his hand. Mind you, we gotta raise our hand every time I say something to keep order. I have no intentions of apologizing to Alice. That was not my intentions. I just want everybody to know that I did call her a asshole <laughs> at breakfast. Here come this other guy. Um, I think that Alice and Steve uh, should uh, take this up with each other uh, back at the hotel. Here comes Steve. I have no intentions of getting nowhere near Alice. I do not respect her. If I get one inch more near her, I'm going to knock her head off. Here come, here come Alice. I'm being threatened for my life. I'm being threatened for my life. I'm writing a letter to the judge. I'm writing a letter to the judge. Here comes Steve. Alice, 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 Alice. I will not hit you. I just want everybody to know I don't respect you, but I will, hit, will not hit you. <laughs> here, come the, here come the Mexican guy. Anybody who wants to hit me can hit me. I'm free <laughs> for any punches anybody might want to give. Now we got this young white guy, right? He's over here going like this. Um, you know, I just, whew, man, I mean, I just, uh, yeah, I feel, you know, I just uh, feel, uh, I feel, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I just, you know, um, you know, I just, uh, I feel like, uh, like I agree with Maria. Ha! Huh? You know, because, you know, when they, when they kept saying it was tired, I told them, I said, I don't believe you when you say you're tired. I said, I work at the post office. I said, I work an eight-hour day. They come and tell me I got two hours overtime. I work two hours overtime, and I do a damn good job of it. And I don't say I'm tired because that is my job, and I'm not tired, and this is our job, and we are not tired. agree with Maria. Don't be pussying around here. If you're so goddamn tired, get your fucking ass out of here. We got three alternates who would love to take your places, so get your ass out of here if you're so tired. Here come the black guy. <laughs> I have not slept in three weeks. In three weeks, I have not had one bit of sleep, and I have broken out in hives and he takes off his shirt. <laughs> and the man is covered in hives all over his body. He is red all over his
his body. He's crying and crying so hard. He goes running out through him. I thought the man was going to have a heart attack. Now we got this high class lady, right? Real good job. She's over in the corner going like this. Huh. Now she busts out crying. I hate arguing, I hate arguing, I hate arguing. Oh, please, if anybody writes a movie, if anybody writes a book, oh, please, please, don't say nothing about my family. And she starts telling us all this stuff about her family. Which we didn't know. <laughs> so why was she telling us now? <laughs> now the black guy gets rushed off to the hospital because he almost had a heart attack. We had to quit. We had to quit. You read about it. You're going to find out. That's why now you know why we had to quit now. If you notice, after that day, everybody broke all this stuff. They did not have nothing to do with the case, right? You know, like once everybody's guilty, you know, they're guilty. Whatever they was feeling inside or they had deep in the back of their minds, you know, Guilty. No, what I'm trying to say, you know, once everybody's personal guilt came out onto the table and was pushed aside, then we could look at the evidence, the testimony. We came to a verdict on Officer Powell like that. Guilty. Nobody cried. Nobody argued. Nobody brought up what happened to their sister six years ago. We just went through the evidence. Boom, 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 boom. Like in school. Boom, boom, boom. Took us five days, four and a half days to get to that AA meeting. After that AA meeting, Took us two days to come up with a verdict on all four of them. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take our race problem and put it in a little teeny playlet like Maria and pack it up so we could go on and help keep the goddamn world alive. Thank you so much for being with me. We'd like, to, uh, we'd like to take the opportunity, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes or so, to open the floor for questions. So if there are any questions, there's one right here. Yes. The question is, uh, is that everyone here? It's about, whether, it's about whether or not Ms. Smith is uh, um, contemplating moving beyond race as a subject matter to the issue of war uh, and other larger issues in the world? Well, um, I give it a lot of thought, and um, right now it's so spectacular that uh, I'm just watching, but uh, everybody should do something. Other questions? Here we go, right there, yes. The question is whether she's ever had uh, people who are being portrayed in the plays attend and see the performance, and if so, what were the reactions? Um, I think the greater majority of them do see it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the theaters that I work at, at usually make an effort to bring the people who have seen it, uh, who have given me interviews even if they're not in the show. Um, you know, people don't usually disclose to me what they think. Um, <laughs> Sometimes relationships develop. The cowboy uh, I brought to New York for when I performed him. He'd never been to New York before. And, you know, uh, that's a very interesting relationship. Also a boxer that I do. And these are people who I've most recently done, which are much longer pieces. Uh, they, they stand on their own. They're not meant to be in a play or anything. 
So uh, I think it's kind of complicated because I think it's one thing to talk to me, and uh, let alone the fact of my impression or my whatever you want to call it, my repeating them, what that must feel like. But also I think then they see themselves as not just who had a one-on-one -on -one with me, but they see themselves in a larger play, in a larger community. And I think that led me to think some things, but I don't really know uh, all that they think. There's a question over here. The question is about the kinds of themes that emerge through inter interviewing and talking to individuals, the grander themes about the humanity that cuts across all the barriers. Well, you know, I'm a little bit, I don't know about those themes, you know. I, I just, I'm so interested in individuals and I'm so interested in particularity. Uh, I really need it in order to do what I do. Um, and I'm looking in an interview for the moment, I'm not looking for the moment that I'm like them at all. I'm looking for the moment when they say something that is so foreign to my understanding or that I realize um, is so foreign that I get sometimes a little nauseous because I understand how vastly different we all are. Um, certainly as an artist, uh, I understand something about, and also has to do with when the audience comes, what they connect to. And I think themes of loss, you know, are something that the audience connects to and understands when someone has lost something, like Mrs. Young Sun Han, you know, her loss, they feel. Um, you know, uh, when I started this work, I write about this in my book, Talk to Me, uh, all I wanted to do was to get people to do what Maria did at the end. I mean, I didn't know that's what I wanted, but I was waiting for doing an interview so that a person would stop talking in a, in a sentence and have to hop up and show me something. Like, they would have to act. And um, I knew that there were certain times that that would happen in the course of an hour, but I had to accelerate that. And I was talking to a linguist, just like at a cocktail party where, you know, just, I mean, happened to be talking, I didn't know, she did, you know, way back when, uh, y years ago in New York. And she said, oh, that's so fascinating what you're doing. Um, I can give you three questions that will make that happen. <laughs> and I, s I would imagine you would like to know what they are. <coughs> and the first question was, have you ever come close to death? The second question was, do you know the circumstances of your birth? And the third question was, have you ever been accused of something that you did not do? And those, every, you know, that last question in particular, have you ever been accused of something that you did not do, is something that brings people really, really forward. I don't ask those questions anymore. They just taught me how to listen. But I would say that those are some themes that, you know, are, are a part of all of our identities and that we have to speak uh, about those questions in order to claim our particularity. We have to say, you know, that time that happened, she said I did that and I didn't. And you know why I didn't? Because this is who I am. And I don't lie and I don't cheat and I don't steal. I'm this, you know. Or I almost died and it was so horrible. And <laughs> oh my God, I saw death. So that I think there are probably things like that that are part of the human experience which are very vivid and particular and animated and cause people to speak from the heart, if that answers your question. The question is about the quality of listening when she begins to speak the piece that's been tape recorded. Uh, I don't know if I understand your question, but I, I think um, it's when I start learning it, which is very hard. <coughs> And that takes a lot of listening. So, uh, you know, uh, I have to listen in a certain way when the interview is going on in order to know when to ask a question and when to not speak. Um, and 
I also have to listen very hard because I'm anticipating that I'm going to have a lot of material, like if I do 280 interviews or something, that's, you know, about 300 hours of tape, then I have to make a narrative. So I'm listening for hooks and things that can tie all these people together. So I'm listening in a very different way than when I'm learning. When I'm learning, I'm really listening for uh, the music of it and what exactly they said and stuff like that. So I've actually never been asked that question before. I think it's a very good question. Um, it's two different kinds of listening. We'll take just one more. Just one more. Let's go uh, up there. Yeah. Uh, Twilight is on video through PBS, as is uh, Fires in the Mirror, both available through uh, PBS. Great. Can we get you all to say a final thank you and good work? This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe.